Hello again everyone, this is Tom. Uh, this is going to be a video on setting up the sound system. Again, this, uh, these videos are completely indexed in the description with all the times, uh, so you can skip ahead wherever you want and get whatever information you need. So to start with here, here's all the crap that makes up your portable sound system. So for your absolute essentials, you got mics, direct boxes, your mixer, amplifiers and speakers, monitor speakers, mic stands, speaker stands, mic cables, instrument cables, speaker cables, power cables. These are all things that you're going to have to add to your checklist of things to bring the setup. Uh, and for your optional equipment, you can add wireless systems, power conditioners, equalizers, feedback and noise killers, individual preamps, gate limiter, compressors, effects modules, recording interfaces, separate analog to digital and digital to analog converters, word clocks. These are all examples of things that you might use someday. Now to the hands-on section. The whole point of the system is to amplify sound, so we'll start with the amplifiers. An amplifier is an electrical component that takes a small electrical signal and makes it big. Probably for most of the systems that you're working with, you're using powered speakers, which means that the amplifier is built into the speaker. This setup is usually the easiest to carry around for your portable systems. It's not too expensive and it still gives you a lot of control. There are a couple of other setups. You can have a powered mixer on smaller systems, which means that all your mixer controls and inputs are on the front of your amplifier casing. I don't like these. And then you will have your standalone amplifiers. You don't usually use these for portable systems unless you need a lot of power. But they are the best, especially if you don't need to move them. Right after the amplifier, the signals go straight to the speaker. There should be nothing between the amp and the speaker except high power cable. It's probably the biggest mistake that people make with sound systems, and uh, they do it all the time. It's a good way to fry your equipment. When you have a powered speaker, you don't need to worry about this because they're already connected. It gets more complicated when you have a separate amp and speaker cabinet. You powered speaker people can skip this next part if you want. By the way, vocab, when you hear the word cabinet or cab, that's referring to the housing for the speaker and everything that's in it. When you're hooking up a speaker to an amplifier, there are two numbers that you need to look at so you don't blow anything up. First you need to look at the power rating for the speaker cab and make sure it's greater than or equal to the power that the amp is going to send it. Next you have to match impedances. If the impedance of the speakers is too low, you'll burn out the amp. The most common impedances that you'll see are probably 2, 4, 8, and 16 ohms. You have to match the number on the speaker with the number on the amp. So what do you do if you're daisy chaining multiple speakers out of a single amp? Passive speakers are usually set up to be wired in parallel. From an electronic standpoint, we treat speakers like resistors. So the math comes from Ohm's law, and your total impedance will be found by adding inverses. Adding another speaker in parallel will drop your total impedance, which is a big deal. So to make things short, forget about learning the math and physics, go online, type in speaker impedance, go to a website that has a speaker impedance calculator, and let that do the work for you. But the quick and easy rule, if you're using two identical speakers, cut the number in half. So two 8 ohm speakers put together will come out to be 4 ohms in the end. So why cut in half? Uh, because the amp will send the same voltage and current to each of those speakers when you hook them up in parallel. So effectively when you hook up that second speaker, the electrons have twice the ability to flow, which means twice the current, which is what's going to destroy the amp. So also when you're da daisy chaining speakers together, the power rating that you'll need for the speaker cab will go down. So two speakers in parallel with a max power of 500 watts can take on a 1000 watt amplifier if they have the same impedance. If you have a weird combination of speakers, uh, to be safe use the calculator you found on the internet before to find what the power rating of each of these speakers needs to be. So a final overview of those amps, pretty much a what not to do section. 
Remember, one, don't put a high power signal into low power equipment. Don't take the cable from the back of the amp and put it into a mixer. Don't use low voltage cables out of the amplifier. The only things coming after an amplifier are your speakers. And you have to use high power cables to hook those up. Number two, make sure your speakers have the right impedance and max power output. And number three, make sure the signal you have going into the amp is a full line level signal so you're not overusing an amp. The more you turn an amp up, the less efficient it gets and the more noise it generates. So you want to be able to use the amp as little as possible. Before going over anything else, I have to go over all the cables that are going to hook everything together. Maybe the one that you'll need the most of are XLR cables. They are the standard for carrying any balanced signal, so mics and balanced line level signals will all use XLR cable. Next is quarter inch TRS. Uh, you'll use this for instrument cables and unbalanced line level signals. Uh, you'll also recognize the three and a half millimeter or the eighth inch TRS, which is the size of your headphone jack. Stereo and balanced TRS exist in both sizes, so you'll run into them probably. For your high power cables, you usually will have either a beefy quarter inch TRS cable or you can have Speak On cable. Speak On has very good connectors and it can handle up to 30 amps, so you'll see it often with heavy systems. RCA cables are what you usually see with your home stereo equipment. Some of your components might use these to hook up to recording gear or something like that. Insert cables are used to insert more components into a channel. It has both an input and output on the same connector on one end, and it breaks out into two separate cables on the other end. So you can use it to loop in more components. And for power cables, we use the standard plugs that almost everyone else uses in other technologies. The most common one will be the universal power cord that you see on computers and such. So the next topic is your mixer. Uh, get a good one. It controls all of your sound. I have a video on how to work this thing, so watch that one to learn how to use it. All of your sound is going to come out of the mixer and go to your amp. You will usually use XLR cable for this. If you have powered speakers, make sure you use the line level input on the speaker and turn it up from there. To have the best noise to signal ratio, the mixer should be running close to its zero decibel level, which is the full signal. You want a full signal to come through this wire going out of the mixer. The more the amp is turned up, again, the more noise it will make. So the main principle is to make sure that you are at a nice full signal at every stage before the amplifier happens so that the amp has to amplify the signal as little as possible. You should use your amplifier controls for the final volume control as much as possible. I will leave it to you to figure out your speaker stands and how to get power from the wall. The only note is that you should position your speakers and throw them on the stands before plugging anything in. So plugging everything in. First is how to set up a mic. I'll show you how I set it up. All we have to do is go microphone, cord, mixer, and that's it. But first, uh, we set up the stand. We use boom stands because we usually have to give room for our singers playing guitar. They're also good because you can set up a music stand right next to the boom, where it's easier to see. You'll just have to take a couple minutes messing around with one to figure out how it works. Make sure the lever that controls the pitch of the boom is tight enough to stay still after the weight of the mic is on the arm. They tend to droop over time. And this is a locking nut. You might have one right next to your mic clip, and you might have one where the boom meets the rest of the mic stand. So once you have your boom and your mic clip rotated at the right angle that you need it to be, turn the locking nut as hard as you can against them, and this will lock them into place without having to rotate them anymore. After you put the mic on the stand, wire it up. Choose a channel on your mixer you want to use and plug it in. Use some method for arranging what channels you're plugging into so it'll be easier to keep track of when you're using your mixer. My philosophy behind plugging in is to plug all the singer microphones to the first few channels because I know that I'll be adjusting them on the mixer the most often. I'll leave a few channels open in case I have to plug in some more singers and then I'll start plugging in the instruments. 
If I am using separate mics for MCs and people giving talks, I put those at the end since I won't have to change settings on them very often. I'll touch them the least. You should always be using the XLR microphone input for microphones. After choosing your channel, run the cord to the mic. I usually put the excess cord in a neat coil at the base of the mic stand and just hang the cord loosely over the boom arm lever. This is because we often need to grab it off the stand. So it's good to have it ready to go if someone needs to grab that microphone, take it off the stand and get on with the show. If that mic is definitely going to stay, you can wrap or clip the cord more securely and get the excess cord out of the way as much as possible. Now for hooking up instruments. Any passive instruments will definitely need a direct box if you are going straight into the mixer. Direct boxes exist because passive instruments were meant to run with a high impedance input, which is what guitar amps and bass amps have. They run the circuit with a high impedance to make up for the fact that it's not a balanced input. It's different from both a mic and a line input, so you need a DI box as a kind of adapter. If your instrument does have a power source, then it can be hard to know if you should use a DI box or not. Many acoustic guitars with the usual battery-powered onboard preamp can just be plugged into a quarter-inch line socket, but some don't work well that way. Experimenting to see what setup works best won't hurt your equipment, as long as you're not overdriving any preamps or anything. So you can go ahead and figure out which way runs the lowest noise and the highest quality by trial and error. So keyboards work the same way. Some are designed to work with a line level input. Some will need a DI box because they're designed to run with a high impedance input. So to hook up an instrument using a DI box, just go quarter inch TRS from the instrument to the box and go XLR the rest of the way from the box to the mixer into a mic input and you're set. You can put the actual box wherever you want. Make sure the volume is turned up on your instrument itself, and then you can run it on the mixer like you would any other microphone. Another BT dub, uh, just so you know, the outputs of a mixer are line level, just like these inputs. I'm just saying that in case you're ever in a stupid situation when you have to hook a mixer into another mixer to get enough channels. Go from line level outputs to line level inputs. Maybe the most important thing about positioning your musicians is making sure their microphones are outside the cone of your speakers. The usual cause of feedback is your sound coming out of the speakers, back into the microphones, and amplified again out of the speakers and back into the microphones over and over again until it's super loud. Split the speakers in front of or to the side of the microphones and instruments as far as possible. The last thing you might set up is a monitor. A monitor is there so your musicians and speakers can hear themselves. If you are in a room full of people singing along, your musicians are not going to hear themselves at all. You will need a separate amp and speaker for your monitor, so I usually just use an extra powered speaker. You can put the monitor speakers in front of the mics. Most stage mics are cardioid mics, which means that you only pick up sound from one direction. They shouldn't be able to pick up that much sound coming from in front of them, but keep in mind that this is an additional thing that can cause feedback. After you set it where you want it, plug it into one of the auxiliary outputs on your mixer, plug it into power, and then turn it on. You'll control it with your auxiliary controls. So to end with, here's some general rules. Some of it's review, some of it's new. Number one, your mics should be behind your speakers, like I just said. Number two, your low power equipment should not be taking high power amplified signals. Number three, your room will sound a lot different with people in it than it does when it's empty. If your speakers are on ground level, make sure that they are higher than everyone's heads so that the sound does not get absorbed by the front row of people. And your system will have to get louder as more people come into the room since human beings don't reflect sound that well. Number four, keep interfering electrical components away. Any type of unshielded power inverter, motor, or transformer will generate a magnetic field which will make a lot of noise if your equipment catches it. But if whatever you have sitting around has an FCC mark, a CE mark, or something like that, then it shouldn't generate any interference, but manufacturers can misuse those marks. And number five, start turning things on from the front of your signal chain to the back, and start turning things off from the back of your signal chain to the front. This means turn your amplifier on last, so you don't pound it with a loud sound of your other equipment turning on. 
and this means that you'll turn it off first so that it doesn't amplify the static discharges that your other equipment is going to make when it gets turned off. If you want a checklist of everything that you will need to set up the sound system, you can scroll all the way down in the description and I have at least a really basic one there. Otherwise, that's it for the general stuff. If you have other components you want me to give instructions on, you'll have to let me know. Uh, but for now, I have a video on a mixer, and hopefully I'll be able to make some on sound recording for uh, some of the SPO stuff that we're doing.